The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the staff and management of WWDB-TV. Welcome to the Rise Above Show. I am Joe Peroni. I'm Heidi Mancini, and we have a special guest today, John Gartner. Yeah, let me uh, tell you who he is first. He's a psychologist. He has graduated from Princeton mm -hmm. Ivy League School, and he worked at Johns Hopkins University for 28 years. He's an author of a few books. We'll get into that a little bit later. And he's also the founder of Duty to Warn. Uh, Dr. John, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. So how are you doing today? Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think uh, with the way in which uh, Donald Trump is being encircled uh, by the forces of justice, I think I'm actually uh, quite anxious. I'm quite anxious. You know, I'm afraid he's going to shoot his way out. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, I was thinking that myself. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't seem like the one who would, you know, sort of surrender, you know, uh, uh, and go by, go peaceably. Um, so I, I think we're in for actually in for a rough ride, uh, given the nature of his uh, mental illness, which I know we're going to talk about. Right. His uh, uh, what he wants to do is strike back in a, in a powerful and destructive way, and uh, he's not inhibited in any by any conscience. Uh, so basically, any you know, like in a bar fight, anything he can grab in our federal government. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, attack his enemies and defend himself. Uh, he's just going to rip up the place. So in your business, do you ever use, say, Trump as a a poster child, so to speak, for narcissism? Because he seems to be just the perfect one. Like if I have a client and I'm trying to talk about <laughs> how somebody devalues, well, let's go with like they idealize somebody and they put him mm -hmm. on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. And he does that with every person he works with, right? Like yeah, yeah. The person he picked is the greatest person. Right. <laughs> and then from Until there, they they're going to do great things. disagree with him, things. and then they're the worst person. Which right, is very and the first second something goes itself. wrong, or he, right. he throws them under the bus. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's a very uh, personality. See, the thing is, he actually has something much more rare mm -hmm. and much more severe than mere narcissistic personality disorder. It's actually a disorder called malignant narcissism that was first introduced by Eric Fromm, the famed analyst and humanistic psychologist. Right. He himself was a refugee from Nazi Germany, and it was his sort of mission to come up with a way to uh, understand uh, uh, dictators like Hitler and Stalin and other murderous dictators. And so he came up with this three-part personality, sometimes called the toxic uh, triangle, but it's actually a fourth part as well. Right. One is narcissism, which we don't need to uh, belabor, but the other is paranoia. So it, uh, this projection of evil onto anyone who disagrees with him or you know, the, the way he demonizes immigrants or, right. you know, or Muslims, uh, that he really sees them as infesting in, you know, uh, in some malevolent way and always feeling aggrieved, always feeling like he's the victim of some kind of plot. So that's the, nar the, the uh, paranoia. And then the third component is antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy, that he's a psychopath. He has no conscience. Uh, he's, you know, he's, he's a grifter. Uh, he, he's a mob boss. I mean, he's someone who r routinely violates the rights of others, exploits others, and has no remorse about it. Uh, you know, he's a predator. Uh, and then the final component is sadism. Right. But these are actually people who actually take pleasure in harming other people and scaring people and degrading people. And, and so the, the, the ways in which he's sort of giving us all, you know, a heart attack and, and you know, the stress symptoms. You know, with all the stress we're under, we're all having different physical and mental symptoms. But um, at some level, I think he actually enjoys the fact that mm -hmm. he's torturing us uh, because he is a sadist. And uh, I think we see that even in some of his uh, sexual behavior. You know, he, he's, he's, he's very aggressive uh, and uh, destructive towards a, a lot of these women. So, um, you know, th this is what the problem is, that he's going to lash out in a way that actually the destruction he's going to do isn't uh, it, a, a bug, it's a feature. It's actually part of the, the fun for him is mm -hmm. to really wreak havoc and destroy. You know, I was thinking, too, okay, so narcissistic 
personality disorder is a personality disorder, obviously. Mm -hmm. But have you ever considered that it also could be a mood disorder? Yes, that's yeah, an excellent it, point. Yeah, I think he's in the very sense hypomanic of, as well. And, and that's, I, I wrote about that in the New Republic, but it's something we don't talk enough about. Uh, you know, he's tweeting in, in, the, you know, in the middle of the night or early in the morning and you know, t sending out 25 tweets. Uh, I think he is hypomanic, and that makes him even more dangerous because it makes him impulsive. Right. Uh, and it also helps, you know, Eric Fromm said the malignant narcissists shade towards psychosis. They begin to believe their own delusional thinking and kind of inhabit their own world. But when you add the hypomania, it makes them more prone to impulsively act out hmm. on this distorted reality. So I think what you're saying also is if you, we have a guy like this, if he is feeling anxiety or he feels like he's being attacked or maybe there's some depression, to make himself feel better, he will actually try to hurt other human beings. Correct. Okay. You know, and a, an example of that is I had the displeasure of writing a, an introduction for a book about his tweets and I had to read thousands of his tweets. and. It's just extraordinary what a high proportion of them are just like the meanest thing you could say to anybody, but in a kind of a, a dumb schoolyard way. You know right. what I mean? Uh, but the, 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 the sheer quantity of them, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like not writing one note uh, that's really nasty to someone, but writing like 34,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> What's disturbing to me, John, with uh, Trump is that there's so many people that um, agree with him and they like him. And that, yeah. that really bothers me probably more than Trump himself, it almost makes you feel kind of scared. I just had this conversation yeah. with a client earlier that, you know, I'm very careful now what I say, who I say it to, because it's caused mm. me to lose friendships, it's caused me to lose clientele. Yeah. And these yeah. people really think Everybody. that he's great, and I don't, that's scary to me. It is scary, and, and you know, it's part of what these demagogues are able to do. That is their talent. Um, and uh, whether it's uh, you know Milosevic or, or, or you know whoever, these dictators uh, manage to basically whip up a, a crowd, and it doesn't have to be the majority. You know, somebody once said, "Never underestimate the power of a committed minority to take over a society." Um, and and so, it, but it's a cult of personality, and so all rules are suspended uh, for this charismatic leader. Uh, and that's actually the state we're in. It is it is a kind of cult. Right. I mean, you know, uh, these leaders, Mussolini, Hitler, I mean, they all created cults of personality around themselves uh, where all the moral laws were, <laughs> were suspended. Uh, this is the situation we're in now. I actually have a theory that it goes back to primate genes, <laughs> that um, if you look at Jane Goodall, she observed these um, you know, uh, chimpanzee communities. Once they split into two communities, uh, one community would have some charismatic male that would you know, get the other males excited and they would go down and to the other community and kill their males and take over their land and their females. And so the community that had that kind of murderous leader, they got their genes got to move on. And I think that's kind of what the demagogue is appealing to. He takes a society that's integrated with it, Serbs and Croats, or in this case, immigrants and non-immigrants, uh, you know, uh, and he basically splits them apart and says, wait a minute, our genes are being threatened and you need a murderous champion to protect our genes. And so then they'll forgive him anything because it's survival. Only one of those two troops survived, right. is my point. And, and I think it's that primitive, and that's why these demagogues are able to activate these very primitive programs deep in our limbic system. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about, as a psychologist, does it worry you that Trump has somehow connected with a group of people that now think that he's like this is the epitome of masculinity like i see that all the time from either um, older men and younger men they seem to think that now yelling people down putting them mm -hmm. down and being openly aggressive mm -hmm. is somehow masculine and the way i was raised mm -hmm. was walk softly and carry a big stick Right, mm -hmm. like if you're if you're an emotionally dysregulated human being, that's the furthest thing from masculinity I can possibly think of. But it seems to me our country is moving to a thing of the more if traits of borderline personality you have, the more manly you are. I think that's very mm -hmm. disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that you know what you see. It, we've seen this in statistics too. I mean, a rise in hate crimes, a, a, a rise in uh, just uh, sort of. 
I don't know if he's been studying um, uh, sexual assault, actually. I don't know about that, but I know there's been a rise in racial hate crimes. But in other words, people being unleashed uh, to act out their um, uh, aggressive fantasies. Uh, and, and, I, and, and, you know, you saw this, you did see this, say, for example, with Hitler, the brown shirts, you know, whenever you watch a movie about World War II, right, these people who are just, you know, members of the party, you know, come see a rally from another, uh, you know, another a, a, a party, and they just start beating everybody up, you know, uh, the way Trump kind of incited violence. You know, a lot of people who don't even talk about his diagnosis say, look, he's dangerous, he's inciting the mob to violence, you know, and he'd say, you know, to punch him in the mouth, I'll pay your legal bills. But John, that, I think you know, he's flushing that, out the That's very punches. serious stuff. You know, I think, John, I interrupted you before, I didn't mean to. Um, I think that he's, no, no. he's flushing out the cockroaches. It's almost like the bad behavior is acceptable now because, well, the president does it, so now I can act accordingly to, you know, whatever the aggression is. And, and I see it a lot more towards, you know, women. Do you? Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, and then there's a lot of, you know, I'm not into this Me Too thing. That's a totally different subject. I'm not supportive of that. But it, it seems that there, there seems to be a little bit more aggression. Mm-hmm. Or acceptability mm-hmm. because you know the what the way he talks about females and he treats them and mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. not around men like that. I try not to be, but <laughs> <laughs> but now, you keep, now you're keeping your mace in your purse. Uh, well, you know, actually, there is research that shows that when uh, the leader of a society uh, changes a moral precept, it's more quickly absorbed into the populace. Um, one of the examples of that actually is when the uh, the government basically started the uh, uprising of the. Uh, uh, the the uh, Hutu killing the Tutsis, um, and they were just broadcasting on government radio over and over again. And the president uh, uh, saying, you know, if, if you're loyal, you know, kill the kill the the, the Tutsis. Uh, and, and so, the, and it just became a mass hysteria, and people started killing them. Uh, so actually, there's there is a danger that when the leader is enabling aggression, things can, can go real south real fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uses that bully pulpit, so to speak, for some really uh, bad reasons, it seems like. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's get into the uh, the Tarasov law, or I think you call it uh, duty to warn. Mm-hmm. Let's um, explain to some people, or let's have you explain to people what, what that is exactly. Yeah, well, the original Tarasov law, where we got the term duty to warn, was a case of a psychologist where his patient mentioned that he... Uh, revealed that he was uh, contemplating or planning to kill his girlfriend, and the pet therapist didn't know what to do because it was he had confidentiality, so he did make some efforts to save her, but he never warned her, uh, and he then successfully killed her. Uh, so it, it then became the law in all 50 states uh, and in the ethics of all you know mental health professions that if you have some sense that someone is in danger, uh, now, this is usually about one of your own patients, right. but the principle being that you have a duty to warn them. Well, what we're saying is that Donald Trump is not our patient, but because of our psychological understanding, we realize how much risk <laughs> the population in general is, and we feel the same ethical requirement that we would feel to warn one person to warn you know, 300 million people, <laughs> that this is not a drill. This is actually a madman in the White House. Uh, and so that's the, where we got the uh, mission for our group and where we got the name. And, and I have to say, I, th- I do feel a certain satisfaction that I think that the mission's been accomplished. I think that the word has gotten out, uh, not only because of our efforts, but because it's so transparently obvious uh, yeah. that we're not the only ones saying it. Uh, but I think at this point, it's sort of baked in that people understand that we are dealing with someone who's impulsive, who's narcissistic, and who's dangerous and who's destructive. Now, what do and it's and to... deteriorating. <laughs> yeah, he's getting worse by the day. But, uh... Yeah, and that's, and that's very important, actually. You know, everybody thought he was going to pivot and become more presidential, but instead it's actually the opposite. We've been in a downward spiral uh, where he's gotten crazier and crazier and been more and more, uh, you know, uh, uninhibited in, in acting out in destructive ways. As he's under pressure with this uh, Mueller investigation and all these investigations, that, uh, Cohen, and, and, and that he's going to feel the noose tightening, that I'm quite worried about what he could do in this time frame. This is, I think, a place of real maximum peril. People need to understand that he's not just a, a, like a, a static a bad quantity. Uh, this is actually a situation that's uh, deteriorating. Hmm. So what do you say to the people that would 
they would question the ability of a therapist to do an assessment on somebody that they have not personally seen. Right. You're referring to the, the Goldwater Rule. Right. Um, actually, it's interesting. The history of the Goldwater Rule is that um, uh, a magazine that um, is now defunct, in part because they got sued, um, wrote an article saying that Barry Goldwater was, you know, that a thousand psychiatrists think Barry Goldwater is mentally unstable. Uh, and actually, people were very worried about whether Barry Goldwater was stable. So it actually had some influence. Uh, and after he lost the election, he, he sued the magazine and won. I think he went, got $75,000. So at that point, the, the, the very first ethics committee, actually, that the American Psychiatric Association had said, you know what, people really shouldn't just, uh, as, it, as it turns out, it was actually more malpractice on the writer's part because he didn't actually accurately report the data. But, you know, people shouldn't be making uh, casual or reckless statements that they can't back up, they don't have support for. Because at that point, uh, the, the predominant diagnostic system was Freudian. So the, the analysts were saying things like, well, you know, he hasn't, uh, he's been scarred by his potty training or he's a latent homosexual. So they were kind of like wild uh, uh, theories without any basis uh, that kind of that, they felt that discredited psychiatry to kind of throw out those terms when you wouldn't know what his potty training was like if you hadn't actually treated him. But in 1980, we switched to a new diagnostic system, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, probably hear it referred to as the DSM, you know, and we keep having new numbers, now we're in the DSM-5. Uh, with, with the aim of the DSM, the, 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 mo the, 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 the most important thing in, in creating it was that they wanted to have observable uh, uh, behavioral criteria for all the disorders. In other words, things where if I can see you, be, see you performing a behavior or you report to me that you did it or someone who knows you well reported that you did it, I can check that box. And so in the case of Donald Trump, we have you know, thousands of hours of observation. You know, can I, if I'm looking at the, the, the criteria for um, antisocial personality disorder, one of them is lies. Um, well, gee, <laughs> is there enough information in the public domain for me to check the box that he lies? I mean, now isn't he like the Guinness Book of World Records champion of lying? <laughs> you know, according to the Washington Post, he's still like 4,589 lies. Uh, so, yes, we can know. These are knowable things. You don't need to you know, put your hands on someone's forehead or meet with them in a room to be able to know whether they perform these behaviors. Yeah, and just to add to what you say, when I do assessments on people, they give me, and as they do it for everybody else, you get about 55 minutes to assess a person you've never met before and you have no right. idea how they interact with other human beings. Right, they come right. to you, they lie half the time, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the other half the time, they don't right. have the self-awareness to really answer yeah. the questions <laughs> in a way that's going to be right. helpful. So I yeah, just that's wanna... such a good point, because I always say it's not like the psychiatric interview is the gold standard of diagnosis. In fact, statistically, it's, it, 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 it is inferior uh, in accuracy to you know, talking to significant others, you know, informants, you know, because just as you say, you, you, you know, you're just seeing, meeting this person. And of course, Donald Trump would lie to me and snow me. And so it's not like I would learn that much, but we know so much about his behavior, you know, uh, so much from so many informants, you know, basically dozens of in, hundreds of informants. And we've observed his behavior ourselves. And we've read his tweets ourselves. So we actually, I know more about Donald Trump and his behavior than all my patients put together. I don't walk around yeah, too, with them all day and see what they do and read their <laughs> social media tweets, you know. <laughs> so are you putting yourself in any kind of danger in any sense by breaking the, the Goldwater rule? You mean professional danger? No one has yes. been sanctioned so far that I know. I've, I've been asking around and people have asked me that. Uh, and actually, uh, I know that since hundreds of people have written to me to say that they have reported me to the licensing board of Maryland, I have to believe that some of them are telling the truth. They've never contacted me. So I think they've made a decision that uh, they're not going to uh, pursue that. So, so far, no, no one has been sanctioned. I mean, what I did get when I went on Fox News was about uh, 20 death threats. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so my good advice to you is there, don't there's go your on first Fox amendment News. right there right <laughs> well exactly no i mean i think one of the things we're also seeing is the use of intimidation mm -hmm. uh, against uh, people who are expressing their political opinion or against the, the press for reporting the truth there really is this kind of um you know the, what's the next step you know where you're you're in, in russia where they kill journalists who uh report the truth so this, there, we, there is really a threat level uh, to the first amendment you're you're right so are you worried at all, professionally or otherwise? No, 
Not really. Not really. They, they haven't uh, called me before the board yet. They haven't called anyone else. Uh, I'm not worried about that. And actually, after I after I didn't do Fox anymore, the the, the harassment has kind of died down. Uh, I'm just I'm worried for the country. You know, I, I'm just worried for that, that, that some really catastrophic things may happen over the next couple of months. And people just need to take that anxiety and that energy. They need to focus it on these midterm elections. Uh, this literally may be our last chance to uh, avoid a complete meltdown, uh, to at least get control of one branch of Congress that will hold him accountable, uh, that will do, you know, um, uh, use their gavel to actually do real hearings and try to gain information to expose this um you know, massive, it's more than corruption. I mean, he, he is working for Vladimir Putin. We have been taken over by a foreign enemy. It's like, you know, Yankovic, you know, he's a puppet president working for Putin. We are, we're an occupied country. It's like Washington is like Vichy France, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't win these midterms, then they will be empowered to completely abolish the uh, democratic institutions. They'll, 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 just, they'll just keep knock them down with a bat. Uh, I, I just hope they're not going to hack the vote. I think if they don't hack the vote, I think the Democrats will win the House of Representatives and there then will at least be an ability to hold him accountable and or impeach him. From a psychological perspective, what do you think it is about an American citizen that would stand with uh, Putin and Russia before they would say anything positive about the Democratic Party? It is very disturbing. You don't need any bullets anymore. It it is very disturbing because there really is a group that that basically say, you know, if he's with Russia, that's fine. I'd rather be with Russia than the the Democrats. And, you know, this is actually how civilizations fall. Uh, There was one of the – I'm going to block on the the Greek um, statesman, but said basically uh, when uh, treason, when there's treason, you know, some kind of an unholy alliance between, you know, a foreign enemy and one party or one – that that's 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 actually how empires fall, and so I think we're actually seeing the end of the American empire. I hope we're not seeing the end of the American democracy, but we are actually in that situation where a foreign enemy is in alliance with uh, a party, and they have basically uh, succeeded in a coup. Hmm. What do you think has pushed the the American psyche that that could actually happen? Well, I think he was a demagogue. I mean, there there are a lot of, uh, uh, and I think it ha- ha- have to be clear. I think it's very uh, on the surface. Uh, there's a lot of aggrieved white voters, uh, some some without education, some with education, um, who are basically pushing back. You know, think of the tri- think of the chimpanzees, right? Okay, and you know they feel like you know this was a majority ruled white nation. And by, you know, whatever year, 2038 or whatever, whites will, will not be the majority anymore. That kind of genetic pressure actually does create a feeling that, hey, they're taking over. You know, we're just going sti- to stand for that. And, and, and so he's tapping into that anxiety and that anger. Uh, and that then becomes primary, like, like with the um, example of the chimpanzee. You don't care what else he's doing. He's going to lead your team to win, and the other team is going to, you know, disappear. So you're you're in for a dime. You're in for a dollar. You know, you're you're behind him. Hmm. Well, the underlying racism that's in our country too. Um, it's absolutely into that. racism it's is, into is, is, is is integral to it. It's all coming back. It's like we as women. I mean, I'm not a, a firm feminist as far as I I love men, so I'm not a male basher. But certainly as a female, I don't want to see us go back a hundred years. Because there, there are certain, like you said, white demographic men that they are sexist and they're racist, but they won't say that. They, they use all the other, you know, rationalization. Right. That's a big lie, which we all know. And that's even scarier. If, you, if you're racist, just say, I don't like black people. I don't like Mexican. I don't like women. Just say it. But don't, don't look for other reasons to dislike somebody that are not even legitimate. You know, I think people my age thought all this was settled with Martin Luther King, you know, and now we're just kind of on a glide path to, <laughs> I don't know what, <laughs> European-style socialism, perhaps. But, um, yeah, no, race has been, what they say, the original sin in America, and we just never seem to be able to get over it. I, I think the other thing, too, that I just find so disturbing is this uh, anti-immigrant, uh, not only rhetoric, but, you know, that they're being roughed up, you know, put on buses, separated from their children. Uh, this country was built by immigrants. Right. Um, if you want to, you know, and I wrote a book called The Hypomanic Edge, 
and it was about um, what counted for America's character and her success is that you're a nation of immigrants. The people with the energy and the restlessness and the ambition and the get up and go to get up and come here uh, are actually a special breed. Only 1% of the world emigrates. So you take 1% on a, on a normal curve, right? At the very, very end of the tail, what makes them different? Their energy, their um, willing to take a risk, their, uh, th that they came here. And so actually then these people are more entrepreneurial. The countries that are the highest in new company creation per capita are America, Canada, Israel, and Australia. What they have in common is they're all nations of immigrants. <laughs> they're also the highest in bipolar disorder. So these people with this restless energy, which, by the way, Donald Trump has as an entrepreneur, and I think Bill Clinton had. I wrote a biography of him where I analyzed him as a hypomanic. You know, so you can use that power for good or you can use it for evil. Um, but uh, it, that energy comes from the immigrants. And Andrew Carnegie himself is an immigrant, said that immigration was the golden stream that fed the American economy. Um, and he said, if that stream ever dried up, you know, uh, then we would economically decline. So actually, by pushing immigrants out, we're actually pushing out the people who would come here and uh, with energy and, and ambition and hard work and uh, add, add value to society. Um, so it's really sad to see them uh, being demonized uh, and, and persecuted. Uh, that's the other thing is, you know, th these kinds of leaders really do persecute and terrorize minorities. And, you know, we, we stopped that child separation policy, but they were building uh, camps in the desert in these military bases with the expectation that they were going to separate one to 200,000 children. Hmm. They, they were ready to go mass production on this. Think about that. Yeah, and they, they have a lot of support for it, too. That's the thing that scares me. Yeah, yeah. And people that I'm live in this you. country, most of us, we're all immigrants. To some, I mean, we've all come from some of my grandparents came from Italy. Uh, Germany. So, you know, when, when I hear people say that send them back to their country, I even told a gentleman, I said, then you need to go back to where you came from, if that's exactly. you know, how we're getting in this country. Yeah, little known fact, actually, uh, Donald Trump's father was actually uh, born in Germany, came to America, and then he went, decided to go back to Germany to resettle, but the Germans decided they didn't want him because he was such a scoundrel, so they forced him to be deported back to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. John, we have to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. There are many insurance companies out there, but none can compare with McDonough Family Insurance. We take time to get to know each and every customer's individual needs. We want you to feel like part of the family and pride ourselves in protecting what matters most to you. Our agency offers all types of insurance, including life, auto, home, health, renters, and business owner policies. We strive for excellence each and every day to make sure that whatever situation arises in your life, you can feel safe, secure, and confident. One call to McDonough Family Insurance Agency will make your world brighter. Call us at 702-684-6989. That's 702 six eight four six nine eight nine we're always here with a smile and ready to help you mcdonough family insurance agency the company that cares welcome back to the rise above show i'm joe peroni i'm heidi mancini and on the line we have dr john gartner a psychologist uh doctor tell everybody uh where they can reach you you have a private practice i believe what in new york city and in uh maryland and baltimore and baltimore, baltimore right did you want to give out your number so people can reach you? Uh, sure. Well, you uh, they can just go to my website, johngartner.com, and they can reach me that way. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I know you, you sent out a thing online that uh, psychologists and therapists could sign. Yes, that's actually what kicked this whole thing off, actually. Uh, very, very soon after the inauguration, I felt I had to do something, and I put a petition online exclusively for mental health professionals, but because it was online, we couldn't control everyone who signed it, but saying basically that we believe that he was dangerously mentally ill and needed to be removed under the 25th Amendment. Mm. And uh, we very quickly had 75,000 signatures. Um, and so that, that petition then actually got news, so it became a story. Uh, and so that then generated sort of magazine articles and newspaper articles about this movement. And uh, then we just kind of kept going from there. Um, we had some, uh, on October 14th, we had meetings in about 15 cities. 
uh, different mental health professionals speaking. Um, and um, uh, actually, my son just came back from France. Uh, there was a French film crew there that I never knew if they produced anything. And he said, his uncle said, oh, yeah, I saw your father on TV. Uh, he said, well, I was only mildly surprised. Um, so we, we did get a lot of attention. And that's why I sort of feel like we have gotten the word out. Uh, at this point, I think the powers that are fighting for control of the country are much you know, more primitive than <laughs> the re refined issue of DSM diagnosis, if you know what I'm saying. So I'm one of the therapists that signed it. So I'm hoping I'm going to go Thank along you. with you to say that I do not get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've not gotten in trouble, right? No, I have not. Uh, let, let's keep it that way. But, <laughs> so I want to talk about one of your uh, colleagues for just a second to, to round sure. this out, a guy named uh, Dr. Alan Francis. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to give you the quote that he actually said because I think it's ridiculous. But uh, uh, I, I'm sh without hearing it, I'm sure it is. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it, there's some profanity in it. I just th think that's so unprofessional. But let's get to the other part of it. He said that you can't uh, you can't diagnose Donald Trump with narcissistic personality disorder because it doesn't actually harm him. Or he, Donald Trump wouldn't admit that it, it it's causing him any suffering. I already know what well, I think about that. What do you think? Well, I, I think there's uh, three ways in which he's wrong. Uh, first of all, the one thing we know about personality disorders, as, as you were talking about in the evaluation, is just because they don't think they have a problem doesn't exactly. mean they have a problem. <laughs> in fact, the sickest ones are the ones that are completely oblivious to the fact that they have a problem. But Al Francis's other... Uh, Sort of specious aspects of his argument is he's looking at it, to, for something to qualify as a disorder, there has to be psychosocial uh, a, a, a decrease in psychosocial functioning or a psychological distress. Right. He's saying, well, look, he's not distressed; he's happy being the way he is, and uh, he couldn't be. We can't say his psychosocial functioning is impaired because look, he's president of the United States. How much more successful can you be than that? <laughs> well, I think both of those arguments are specious. Uh, Hello, I'm sorry. I oh, okay. I thought out. we lost I apologize. you. I did lose you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you there. And then I had to get it back in. But both of those arguments are specious because, first of all, it does cause him distress, right? That's why he's up at, at one in the morning, you know, tweeting uh, uh, against the forces uh, that are trying to hold him accountable for his criminal behavior. Yes, actually, if you are a malignant narcissist, you're not someone who lives this kind of zen, peaceful life. Uh, mm -hmm. You're in constant battle and combat and conflict with the people around you so it causes you a lot of distress you think it's all their fault <laughs> but you know constantly we know from people who work with him in the white house that he is constantly erupting screaming right. enraged you know uh, and they're all kind of tiptoeing around him but he's like a, a mount vesuvius of rage so i, I so my, al francis is wrong there we'll check that box he has psychological distress and yes it does decrease his functioning you know, we see people every day uh, through employee assistance programs who are very brilliant and gifted and, you know, who are very good at their jobs and are very successful, but they have a psychological problem that impairs them in being able to do their job well or effectively. Uh, and he, he is not doing his job well or effectively because of his personality disorder and his hypomania. Right. So, the, so as a result, if he was in an employee assistance program, you know, He's the kind of person that we'd like, you know, give him therapy, we'd give him an employee performance improvement plan, but to be honest, he'd be fired by now because he wouldn't have changed. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he's, imagine you had someone at Johns Hopkins, you know, where I used to work in the employee assistance program uh, there once, once in a while, and uh, he's lying to everybody, okay? He's, like, attacking everyone else in the workplace. Right. Uh, we find out he's a history of sexual assault and uh, kind of shady criminal behavior. Uh, and, you know, he's he, he's getting getting into conflict with everyone. I mean, this is the kind of person who would be drummed out of their job, whatever it was. A CEO could be CEO. No CEO would get away with this. He's actually found the one job where there is no accountability other than impeachment. <laughs> So this Alan Francis, can we say this about him most likely? He's saying that sure. he's, he's the one who wrote the rules for diagnosing personality disorders. He did not. Yeah, he's I was not say, the so only one. Says, like 10 that's part of his narcissism, uh, frankly. It was a committee, and he, makes all, he, he always starts his quote with, 
I wrote the, the, the rules about diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. It's like it's a committee, so that's a narcissistic statement, just, just saying. Exactly. <laughs> Do you think he is somehow looking at Donald Trump and, under, like, he, he just sees himself in a mirror kind of way? And Is this why he's coming you know, to know, I actually country? don't know what the heck Alan is thinking. I, I, I knew him at New York Hospital. I feel like he's lost his mind. He's like Alan Dershowitz, you know, like, what, what the heck's going on? <laughs> <laughs> so, Doctor, you seem pretty okay with, like, being a maverick a little bit and challenging the herd mentality. Would you agree? Sure. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, I, I was born that way before it had any any constructive use. Where do you think you got your biggest influence to to be a maverick from? Well, that's a, a, a great question. Well, I think I think I do have the the, the, the maverick genes that you know I was talking about. Um, but it's true. My mom was actually one of the founders of the National Organization of Women. Uh, she's actually a little footnote in the history books, but during their um, their first demonstration was the demonstration at the Waldorf, uh, the Oak Bar, where they didn't seat women. So they made a reservation in the name of Dr. Gartner. And when they wouldn't seat them, they, you know, protested with uh, signs. They were like fur coats and they looked like very elegant women who should be admitted to the Oak Bar. Uh, and uh, so there's that. And then my, my father was sort of a crusader, too, come to think of it. You know, he had different causes that he would uh, champion. So, yeah, I guess this is, that's sort of in our blood. Um, but, you know, this is actually something that um, I never would have taken on if it didn't feel like an emergency. I mean, I've never been politically active, for example. The last politically active thing I did was collect, you know, signatures against the Vietnam War in Central Park in 1974. You know, so <laughs> this was really an emergency. It, it wasn't. Uh, uh, I, and, and actually, unfortunately, uh, things are evolving in, in much the way we feared and warned. So things are getting into very, very dangerous territory. And, and it was the, the extent of the danger and the fact that as mental health professionals, we could see it more clearly, perhaps, because of our training that just did make it imperative uh, morally. You know, that if you see something, say something. You know, <laughs> this is a matter of national security. Now, when I'm with a client and I'm dealing with somebody that's a, a victim of narcissistic abuse, mm -hmm. One of the things that I would try to do is to, I, I want to wonder why they're attracted to that type of person and why mm. they stay there. Mm. And typically mm -hmm. it's some type of codependence, it's uh, sure. victimhood, it's, it's a long list of things, as you know. So if, let's extrapolate that to the country. So if we have a president who is the poster boy mm -hmm. for being a narcissist, malignant narcissist, Right. The people that attach themselves to that are the people that I'm worried about more, right? Like, and I agree with what you say. Like, he is a clear and present danger because of his position, no doubt. But if we had a healthy electorate in this country, he mm -hmm. would just be some whining jerk just babbling in a corner by himself. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the sickness yeah. of the United States of America's electorate that has given him yeah. that kind of power. So can we talk to the electorate, in a sense? What's really guiding them? It, it, it is really breathtaking, uh, and I think we all feel like we've gone through the looking glass. And, you know, I, I'm old enough to have lived through Watergate, and it's like people were capable of being shocked then. You know what I mean? It's like when they heard the tapes, you know, that changed everything. You get the feeling here which is there's no tapes of any kind that could change uh, you know, the blind loyalty of, 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 of these people. Uh, so it's very disturbing. I think one of the actually uh, secrets to it is the propaganda of Fox News. Uh, True. You know, it used to be, I mean, everything we learned about Watergate, we learned from you either watched the hearings on ABC, NBC, you know, or you read about it in the New York Times, the Washington Post, but it was all legitimate media. You know, the, the so called fake news is actually the only real news. Um, and, uh, and, and Roger Ailes had the idea, and I think he had it in the 80s, uh, that, that, that they should come up with a, basically a propaganda channel for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyone I talk to, sometimes they're people who I respect, who are intelligent, who actually, you know, I talk to them about Russia, and they say, oh, isn't that just kind of a hoax? Or, you know, isn't that, you know, like, and you realize they're repeating a tagline from Fox 
and or from Trump's Twitter feed, but they, they, they reinforce each other. And so it's, it's actually, uh, you're probably familiar with the idea of social inoculation of an idea. You know, if you give someone a weak strain of an idea and then all the arguments against it, they're now resistant to that idea. And so what Fox does very cleverly is they get kind of liberal punching bags on there or someone who sort of expresses the liberal uh, point of view, but in a very weak way. And then exactly. they have all these people sort of ridiculing them and kind of showing how ridiculous it is. And basically, if you watch Fox News, it's like, the, you know, those science fiction things where like, you know, if you eat the fruit, then you become a zombie and, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. or if you, <laughs> you know, if you watch Fox News, you are actually um, in the vortex of propaganda and you actually now are cut off you're actually cut off from facts. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you remember uh, the movie or the book, 1984? Yes. So freedom is the freedom to say 2 plus 2 equals 4. You remember that part? Hmm. No, actually, I didn't. That's a okay, good one. Okay, well, let's go over that for a second. So the, <laughs> freedom is the freedom to say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mm -hmm. But if you torture somebody enough, right. and they... You can make them say anything you want. So yeah. I, I'm noticing like in our society right now, it's like, okay, so we can have this really good and um, productive conversation. When yeah. I leave here, I'm mm -hmm. going to be dealing with people that only deal in propaganda, in lies, in, yeah. in it's ridiculous. It's, um, it's a really strange thing that they could get together and somehow psychologically manipulate millions of people to the point where I think Giuliani even said it the other day: "Truth is not mm -hmm. the truth." Right. You know, right. and even that Trump said, like a, "Don't a believe your eyes and ears." Doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like he stole that from um, 1984? Truth is not truth. You know, like it sounds like it because even a couple of weeks before, when when Trump said, "Don't believe your eyes and ears." <laughs> That's exactly – now, I'm not going to give him the credit to say he actually read the book because I, I, right, I, I right. really doubt that. But the, but the process is the same. It's manipulating. Well, I think the author understood the nature of fascism, right. uh, that, that, that that actually is what has to happen is – yeah, and they have, I think, this parade. Maybe that's Animal Farm, I think. George Orwell's book, where they, the pigs that are taking over the society are marching with these signs that say, you know, truth are lies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like war is peace. <laughs> exactly. No, that, that, that's, you're exactly right. That's from 1984. But you know, how many conversations have you had with people in person or on Facebook where you will say that, okay, it's whatever, you'll name a fact. You can say yeah. when Obama left office, he had 75 months of job creation, and they'll go, fake news. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's verifiable. Like, it's mm -hmm. verifiable. Like, they can't even understand a fact. It's like looking up in the sky, yeah. and it's a perfectly sunny day, and you go, it's a sunny day, and they go, nah, it's raining. Like, I know. It's, 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 it is quite frightening. Uh, I mean, maybe I haven't looked was right. There are some, you can fool some of the people all the time. But this is a, a group of people who are now are a very powerful political force and being manipulated by a very evil leader. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is terrifying. Is it possible that when Trump, maybe about two years ago, said, I could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue mm -hmm. and not lose any support? Yeah, is it possible he that he really did have his finger on the pulse of the sickness of the electorate in the United States? And yes. maybe he's intelligent in that way. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. It's, it's in a way, I mean, even though he, he seems cognitively impaired, that's one of the other articles we've written about in terms of real, real signs of pre-dementia in him. Yet, yet, despite that, there's a genius that he had uh, in terms of realizing that if, if I become the demagogue of these disenchanted white people, they'll forgive me anything. I can say anything. I can do anything. And they'll still follow me. He got that. He right. got that before that idea even seemed possible. So you, you got to give him that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how he did it, but it, it's <laughs> but he was right. And I got to give him that because I still can't yeah. even figure it out from a psychological perspective of how it's changed so much. Like, I have some good friends that are Republicans. Sure. And in no way, shape, or form are they okay with this. They're just people right, that like prefer right. smaller government, you know, that type yeah, of thing. Of course, of course, yeah. But this is a whole different animal. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, because there's a difference between, uh, you know, 
those kinds of views that you're talking about that are very common. And, you know, actually, especially among uh, um, educated people in the suburbs who you know, want low taxes and less right regulation and that, they, that that's their governing philosophy. Those people, I think, are appalled because now it's really become a party of fascism. And I think all those people have fled the party, actually. Uh, you see it at the intellectual level, right? You see, you know, all the people who have left, David French, Max Boot. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the people who have, uh, George Will, you know, who um, uh, Steve Schmidt, who, have, you know, um, uh, resigned from the Republican Party. But you know what? They don't need them. It's apparently, this vortex is so powerful, they don't need the traditional Republicans. And they feel like they don't need the Chamber of Commerce, who's going crazy over these tariffs. They're, sort of, they're saying to the business Republicans, to hell with you. We don't need you. You know, we've got the mob. <laughs> hmm. Does it remind you of the Know Nothing Party way back when? Well, yes, but I mean, to be honest, I'm not, my, my, my depth of the Know Nothing Party is uh, not that much more than nothing. But uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I do know about the Know Nothing Party is it didn't take off. <laughs> <laughs> so here's something interesting for you. So... We're broadcasting right now from Las Vegas, and in rural Nevada, there's really no mental health services, very, very little. Mm. Mm. So many of the clients that I I treat are through uh, teletherapy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, me too. And of course, I don't do the political thing with them at all, but you know, right, right. I'm a human being, so I hear it. Comes up, of course. So most of the time, they're in rural areas, um, 100% of the time, they're on Medicaid, mm -hmm. and I would say 95% of the time, they're all Trump mm. fans because they can't stand <laughs> government intervention, and they don't like people who who bleed the system. But they're and on I, Medicaid. Right, that's my point. Like, so, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to make fun of my own clientele because I would never do that in you know, no, no, no. Their I, face. I mean, it, it, but, I'm sure they're on it legitimately, and I'm glad they're getting the services, mm -hmm. but it seems irrational then that they would... Uh, resent the program that they're benefiting from right. uh, as if they're getting somehow ripped off, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're originally yeah, from it, New York? Wild. What'd you say? Uh, you're originally from New York? Yeah, absolutely. New okay. York City. So I, I am too. How do you get an educated person from New York to somehow connect with people in rural areas without mm -hmm. seeming condescending. I, I know what you're saying. I think this is an enigma people have really been trying to solve, like, like how can we get through to these voters? Um, and you know what? I have a different um, thought about it. I think we have to accept that we cannot get through to these voters. Uh, oh, we need to overwhelm them at the polls so we can restore some sanity to the, you know, there's like a madman, you know, flying the plane, you know what I mean? And, and we just want to get into that cockpit, right? And just take control of the wheel so that the, the plane doesn't get crashed. Uh, we're not going to convince them in two months, you know, that, that they should uh, vote for the Democratic uh, representative. But what we need to do, and I think this is very important, is motivate our base. And I hope these kids in college are going to come out and vote. Uh, I think that women are going to come out and vote in record numbers. They are definitely energized, black women and white women. And I think the uh, white women, some of them voted for Trump. I think they're solidly against what he's doing now, and they're, they're, they're crossing over. So I think that this is, a, you know, this, this is at a stage where now we're at war. You don't say in the middle of war, well, maybe if we talk to some of the Germans. You know, maybe we could sort of hash this out. No, you've got to win. Okay? This, is, this is existential, you know, do or die. Uh, where we have to sort of fight them in the beaches, fight them in the streets. Mm. Um, we have to win. Uh, yes. Otherwise, you know, really all is lost. No, I, I agree with you. There, there's a great book. It's got to be, I don't know, 60 years old now. And you, you actually referenced him before. It's uh, Dale Carnegie. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. How, how to Win Friends and Influence People. I'm sure you haven't picked up that book in like 30 years. But uh, <laughs> the parts in it that I really remember – are that when you're trying to create something with somebody or you're trying to come to some agreement, what you do is you, you talk about the things you already agree with and you meet them on that area and then you give them compliments, right? And then you move from there. And I'm like, well, I don't know if Dale Carnegie had to deal with the level 
of, you know, I mean, we glorify being uneducated now. I think that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a little perverse in itself. <laughs> and, you know, and the, the level of narcissism that I think is rose through a lot of things, including social media, mm-hmm. that I'll be, I'll be the one to say it. I think that great book by Andrew uh, Dale Carnegie is probably almost obsolete at this point. And I think your way is the better way to go. What do you think? Well, he's, he's certainly sold enough copies to, to yeah. feel like he was a success. <laughs> but but, but I, I think the thing is, is that you're really, it, it reminded me of the research I did in the 70s on cults. Um, and how, how the, the only way to get your kid out of a cult was to hire this guy, something Patrick, and he would literally kidnap your child out of the cult and lock him in a hotel room and force him to, to talk to you. <laughs> you know, he forced him to like read like here this is what the scriptures say this is what the teacher said why 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 don't they go together and sort of deprogram them for like <laughs> three days before finally it would sort of occur to them what have i done this is crazy uh because the totalistic environment they're in keeps supporting their crazy cult beliefs and i think that's where fox news and and, and social media and living in a rural area where your your peers are are are, are Trump supporters, you have a kind of hermetically sealed, you know, package here, right. uh, where, where you're just not going to be able to break through with a, a kind of a, with the Dale Carnegie move. With all respect to Dale. <laughs> yeah, it's obsolete. <laughs> so, Doctor, I want to thank you for being on the show. We only have like a minute left, but um, would you consider maybe coming back at another time? I'd like to talk to you about uh, Bill Clinton and the hypomanic edge and things like this that I've been looking into. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 yes, absolutely. I, I absolutely enjoy talking with you both. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, let everybody know um, where they can reach you and. Yeah, yeah, and I should put in a, a plug for, for for duty to warn. We have a website, and also we just came out with a book, Rocket Man: um, Nuclear Madness in the Mind of Donald Trump. It's an edited book. Uh, really, actually, very happy with the way it came out. A lot of really great uh, writers talking about the issues related to Donald Trump's psyche and the risks of nuclear war which I think is really, we didn't talk much about today, but that's sort of the ultimate nightmare. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, I urge people to (laughs) look that up. And um, we're trying to work on a documentary or film, hashtag unfit. So if you, if you see it around, (laughs) if we ever make it, (laughs) that's the other thing I'm, I'm I'm instructed to plug. All right, then. So this has been the Rise Above Show. I'm Joe Peroni. Heidi Mancini. And uh, thank you, Dr. John Gartner, for being here today. Thanks for having me.